All right, I think we are live right now. I am so sorry about uh, this uh, technical problem. We, uh, at our office, our whole internet went down and then we had to reboot the router. And then of course, uh, all of our wonderful uh, software failed us as well. So Brian, who was going to be with us, uh, and this was going to be a full uh, Tiffin image maker, uh, image maker series, uh, I'm not going to be able to see Brian. Uh, I am uh, your um, your host, and uh, <laughs> I'm your host and your presenter today. So. Um, I know that uh, David and Brian are going to be working in the background uh, to be able to field uh, questions that come in, uh, but I just wanted to thank you all for your patience. Uh, we are 34 minutes uh, late, so I hope uh, you have stayed on uh, to, uh, to enjoy this presentation because there's some uh, amazing golden nuggets in this thing for you all to take away. Um, okay, so Weldon, are we live? Are we doing well? I hear nothing from him. So uh, hopefully we are uh, doing well. And uh, I want to thank Tiffin uh, for putting this all together and getting everyone um, uh, logged in. And, and uh, again, like I said, thank you so much for um, being patient with me and uh, our technical difficulties. Okay. All right. So, um, are you seeing any, okay. So I'm going to share my screen with all of you and, um, hit play here. Okay, so you should be seeing uh, the secrets behind rich skin tones in the digital age. So one of the things that um, I have been kind of in search of is this, you know, when, when I was in film, you know, you use neutral density on the camera and there was never this problem with uh, infrared and, and IR. Uh, so... I um, immediately had uh, gravitated towards uh, trying to find a um, neutral density that worked with uh, all of these digital sensors. And I wanted to be able to use um, a heavy neutral density. So I was, during my day exteriors, I could... Uh, use neutral density all the way down 10 stops if needed, 12 stops if needed uh, to get me down to a 1, 4, or a 2 for day exteriors. So um, when Gabriel Muccino, we had worked on fathers and daughters together. And uh, he called me up and he said he had this movie in Italy and uh, did I want to come over and, and be a part of this whole thing? And I was like, yes, I am on board. This sounds incredible. Uh, like I said, we had done Fathers and Daughters together uh, with Russell Crowe, Amanda Seyfried, Aaron Paul, Diane Kruger. Uh, it was uh, Octavia Spencer, Jane Fonda. It was an amazing cast and an incredible uh, collaboration. Uh, Casa Tutta Bene was the first time that uh, all this engineering that uh, I did with Tiffin, I basically took the red sensor and I was like, okay, how can we find this perfect IR cocktail that can go 12, 13 stops of neutral density? And how can we do it where it is not like uh, the true ND full spectrum uh, filters? Because what they were is they just sprayed the filter, uh, sprayed the, the contents of their IR straight to glass. So what ended up happening is if you put any tape on the filter, like if you wanted to 
put the filter and stick it to like the Movi or the Ronin. Uh, and uh, you just wanted to butyl that thing on there, uh, you would pull it off and it would literally pull all of the coating from your $900 4x5 filter right off of it. So I immediately saw that this was not going to be working in my world because um, I tape and use gaffer's tape and all different ways to, to apply filters. So I turned to Tiff and I go, we have to find a way to sandwich your uh, color science of this IR and full spectrum technology uh, inside of this uh, between two pieces of glass. And that ended up being very, very difficult to do. And it took us over about a year and a half of constant testing of, you know, completely going back to the dr drawing board while uh, we were trying to get the levels so they were consistent at one stop, two stop, three stop, four stop, as well as keeping a consistent color all the way up to 10 or 12 stops. And this is a daunting task because if you look at the filters out there on the market, whether it's Firecrest, uh, you know, some of the Panavision, some of the um, other different manufacturers that call themselves full spectrum MDs. When you get past the 1.5 and 1.8, uh, it either goes full magenta or it goes a radical cyan. And these things I was not having. I, I didn't want, you know, I wanted to be able to use this uh, neutral density at a very, uh, thick level and I didn't want all these color shift because when you have a color shift of magenta, it's very difficult to get that out uh, and dial it out in the color correction process. So we all know about neutral density and what I'm going to be showing you here is just a straight neutral density on, this is like, it has no IR. There's no IR, there's no full spectrum. These are just old neutral densities that used to be there for using film. So this is with no ND and I've graded it to bring it back to kind of a balanced image. Now I jumped from uh, no ND to 0.9 because that's where I started to see the shift on most of your uh, digital sensors. Um, you know, dealing with the Alexa, it obviously has its own uh, ND wheel. Uh, dealing with the Canons, it has their own internal NDs, but the RED cameras do not. Uh, that's why they're able to keep the cameras very, very small and compact uh, and, and supercharged with a, a very uh, high-tech, uh, you know, system. Um, and being small is very important to me. But you can see at the point nine, uh, it's already starting to take on. Look at the, the, the color of her jacket, which was black. Uh, you know, see, you see it there with no ND. Immediately, it's starting to take on this purple tone. And this is me at one five trying to grade it out. And it's just not happening. When I go to a one eight, the whole image is infused with this tonality of brown and purple tones uh, that you just cannot get out. And you can see the uh, grade, ungraded over on the other side of just how uh, intense this is and how hard it makes you uh, as a colorist and as a director of photography to deal with these situations. So when I uh, went to Tiffin and we literally for a year and a half went back and forth and back and forth, we were able to create a filter that gives you these rich skin tones. And people have constantly come to me and they said, Shane, what are you doing on this film? It's so, the skin tones are so unique and so 
you know, beautiful in all the tonalities, whether it's warm or gold or an orange quality or right here where it's this neutral quality of light coming through uh, the windows of kind of open shade. The beautiful uh, skin tones of lighting him. I had a, a top light on him and then I pushed through ricocheting 4K pars off of um, mirrors to give us these kind of shadows, these hard shadows on the left and right side through these windows that kind of framed this scenario. Being able to have that beautiful color coming through uh, the windows uh, of, of warmer light and these beautiful tones that I was able to create. Now, you can say, oh yes, it's the sensor. Uh, yes, the red and the Alexa sensor give you, um, you know, beautiful skin tones. But by you using the wrong neutral density, you are uh, losing a lot of vitality and a lot of definition and beautiful different tones within the skin that uh, give it the life. Because when it's all said and done, it's all the emotion, the face, the eyes, that vitality, uh, that broken, that, uh, you know, damaged, uh, the, the happiness, the, 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 you know, all these things, a face can emit all these different emotions. And that's what uh, I really wanted to be able to bring about. Uh, with this new line of filtration and the ability to taking it up to very serious amounts of neutral density, which we did on Acasa Tuta Bene. But you can see how the blue and the warm tones work wonderfully with this. And the like, I, I cannot express enough about the vitality of the skin. And, and having that, that essence. And even in night exteriors, uh, look at the tonalities that you're getting here uh, in the, the, the skin and how it's falling off and it falls into the shadows. Now, one thing that everyone says, well, what, what do you mean? You're using neutral density at night? Uh, yes, uh, I light uh, a little brighter at night, so um, I either with a 3 or an ND6, uh, I'll crank the, the ISO up to 1600 uh, on the Gemini and have that uh, neutral density in there so when I come in for the close-ups, I can be shooting at a 2 for all the wides, uh, and, and when I go in for the mediums and the tight shots, I really help uh, our focus puller out as well as, uh, again, delivering the emotion. I always feel like if the nose is out of focus and the eye is sharp, that's a little, uh, you know, not so nice uh, to delivering the emotion. So I like to have the nose and the eyes in focus, and that takes a little more depth of field. So by lighting my night exteriors to a brighter, um, you know, level and using neutral density, either a three or a six, and then pulling it when we go in for the close-ups is something that I have really embraced over the years of being a cinematographer and just know that seeing that nose and eye in focus is, is very important uh, in delivering the emotion. Uh, again, you can see these, how um, it's handling uh, all these different tonalities in the mix. And look at this, where this scene was something where uh, they had just made love and they were having this conversation and I wanted the shallow depth of field, so I lit it. Uh, this is actually 3200 ISO uh, and I uh, took it all the way down to a 1.4 and a 2 at times and wanted the nose and just the eye to be in focus, uh, and maybe her lips. Uh, so the nose was out, but the eye and her lips were in. This is what worked very well for this conversation that happened after they had made love. 
But uh, in other situations, I like, so, you know, the cool thing about this is it gives you that wonderful ability to either have a uh, deeper depth of field on the face or not. Uh, again, it also handles the skin tones where I made this, I lit this all with those CFLs. Like there's in that middle sconce there, uh, there's a CFL, uh, which was like a warm white. So it infused this kind of green cast throughout the room. And then integrating the hot, hot sunlight mixed with the cool cyan tones of outside. Uh, I just, you can't get a better skin tone that you're seeing right here on this uh, actress. Uh, I just love the the tonalities and how beautiful it the cream uh, is is what I see. Now, you saw pictures of the neutral density and it has this very kind of gold cast. Well, the gold cast does not come across on camera. That is literally the IR that's being sandwiched in between two pieces of glass, which is giving us uh, that ability to reflect the IR off of the sensor and push it back uh, and then enable it to be a absolutely clean image. So in color correction, it gives you the best possibility to getting in there and delivering skin tones like these, uh, which, um, you know, like I said, everyone has been reaching out to me saying, Shane, wh what did you do on this movie uh, that is so unique? And this, like I said, was the first film that I used the um, Timage, the Tiffin Natural NDs on. Look at this beautiful tonalities, even in the colds uh, and the warms and the mix. Uh, it's just really coming off uh, beautifully. And as um, we slide out of Casa Tuta Bene, we're going to go into now Resident Alien, which was what I call the magic combo. So on Resident Alien, I took the fully vetted, now that I had shot on uh, Casa Tuta Bene, I had really vetted and we did even more changes to the natural NDs, kind of evening them out uh, and making sure that they were really true and keeping the color consistent across 10 stops worth of ND. I wanted to use this combo and not many people know about this filter. And I just want to read to you what this filter does because it's absolutely unique in what it does. Okay. It's a Tiffin digital diffusion effects. And this is a filter that came about truly right as the digital age was coming. And this is kind of my description of what I feel it does. The Tiffin Digital Diffusion Effects Filter is a softening and diffusion filter specifically meant to appear invisible, okay? This is a big deal. As if no filtration is being applied, okay? So where you would do a soft effects or a black pro mist or a white pro mist or a black satin or a Hollywood black magic, those filters are going to take any highlights and they're going to create a halo. They're going to create a bloom. Now, depending on how heavy you make that filter, uh, you will get a less of a bloom or more of a bloom, but it's going to show its cards by blooming these highlights. The digital diffusion doesn't bloom highlights. Compared to other digital, the filter offers virtually no flare or loss of contrast. So by using this filter, you do not use uh, lose any kind of a contrast. You, uh, but what it does is it goes in and seeks out facial blemishes and wrinkles. And what it does is it creates a cream this creamy skin tones that I always talk about. What is cream? What is this creamy skin tone, Shane, that you talk about? It is a, uh, this is what this filter does. And it's so unique. 
And then it also takes anything that would blow out of focus, any uh, highlight or something that would clip, specifically on the red camera, the red clips very quickly, okay? And it it clicks, uh, it, it holds its like 13 or 14 stops of latitude on the Gemini or 16 stops on the Monstro. And then it just goes very quickly. So I was like, how can I make this look more like the Alexa? I want to keep my beautiful red uh, camera that's very small and very compact and gives me all these different ways to create internally. Like I, I look at the red Gemini or the red Monstro and I look at it as more of a, a photochemical process because there's so many things inside the camera that I can change that I can literally bake into that raw file. So I am embracing anything that I can make it look more filmic. And what I'm doing is I, with this combo of the neutral density mixed with the, um, mixed with the uh, Tiffin digital diffusion effects, I'm able to take those highlights and roll them off. They bloom and cream out and overexpose like film. And this was that aha moment. And I know I'm on to something because every movie I go to and I'm working with a, uh, a new DIT, they're always saying, what is this secret sauce, Shane? What is this um, incredible look that you have going on here? So I did a ton of testing and I'm sharing this chart with you. Uh, you know, I, these are my golden nuggets that I'm, I'm uh, sharing with all of you. This is literally my uh, lens and my digi diffusion chart. So as the lens gets tighter, the diffusion goes down. Uh, I had Tiffin uh, do all the way up to nine because on safety, uh, I was using extreme wide angle lenses and I was making six by six and 10 inch by 10 inch filters to be able to do an eight millimeter, a 10 millimeter, a 12 millimeter. So I went to like a nine and then an eight and then a seven on those wide uh, lenses. And then at the 15 millimeter on a Summicron, I went to a six, the 18, a five, 21 and 25, a four, 29 mil, a three, and a 35, a three. So this is a perfect recipe to keep a consistent level of diffusion across all of these primes. And then when I go to my Agenu 4 to 1 or 12 to 1 Optimo Zoom, I go a 3 to a 1 based on those levels because the Agenu is a little uh, softer glass. There's obviously more uh, pieces of glass and optics in there. So I use this as a sliding chart. If we go all the way to a 290, I've had them engineer uh, the diffusion uh, filter, digi diffusion all the way down to a 16th. And that works beautiful on a 290. And then if I'm at a 24 millimeter, I'm at a two on the 12 to one. So you can see how this uh, works uh, for keeping this consistent level all the way across uh, your, your primes and your zooms. Now, I also had to go to Tiffin and they had engineered the filters to seven stops worth. And I go, we got to go more. We got to go all to a 3.0, which is equivalent to 10 stops. So that's what we were going with. So they engineered the naturals to go to 10 stops of ND for shallow focus on day exteriors and absolutely no color shift. Now here's a, a beautiful image on Resident Alien. This was in Vancouver. Uh, this was in this incredible like little bay uh, which had had this peninsula. We built this cabin out in the middle of, of this uh, peninsula. And this is where our uh, alien lives. Uh, the police come to, to get him to uh, have him check out a body. Uh, because the local doctor in town has been murdered. Uh, but you can see how the creaminess of our skin tones 
uh, is uh, going in with this combo of the neutral density mixed with the digital diffusion. And look how good it looks on black skin tones as well. And this is one... Oh, sorry. Not now, please. <laughs> uh, so, you know, this is the one thing that's feedback that I've gotten from a lot of people is the natural NDs really respond to uh, black skin tones really nicely. And so this is another benefit of this incredible uh, line of neutral densities. Um, and... You know, what I want to orchestrate with this photo is see the hot overexposed sun that's coming in. Uh, that doesn't feel clippy. And uh, so it doesn't feel that way because of the digital diffusion going in there and taking those highlights in the background and just fuzzing them out and creaming them out ever so slightly. So it rolls off in that overexposure uh, very filmic like, but these are, you know, I wanted to see how, uh, the digital diffusion combo, uh, with the natural NDs worked inside with these lower light levels inside the car. And it's just a beautiful consistency into his skin tones. But like what I talk about the vitality, I'm talking about how, you know, it gradiates from the top of his head that has two or different tones down into his face that has kind of one tonality and then it falls off into another tonality down there. This is the vitality that I talk about on these skin tones. And it also, when you have like uh, semi-hot windows, uh, it, it also blooms uh, them very well. And I love the sheen factor. It creams out uh, the sheen like on his forehead and on his nose. It just makes it more appealing. Uh, again, here's the dark skin tones of, uh, you know, our, our character in here, the sheriff, and how well those, those look with this combo platter. And the, this is a, this actress was Native American as well. So you're having a, a, a different tonality there, uh, you know, a little more warm and, and uh, yellow tones within her skin mixed with Alan, who's, uh, you know, very white. Uh, those tonalities really worked out well. Also look at the light, uh, the operating light at the top. See how I was able to, those highlights look beautiful in regards to, they're just blowing out so nicely. They're not giving us this clippiness. Uh, and again, this is all the combo of neutral density mixed with this digital diffusion. Now, do you have to, to necessarily have the, the natural NDs in there to create this effect? Uh, you know, like if you lit it and you didn't have, you didn't need neutral densities, this is where you want it. Of course, the digital diffusion is going to, uh, bloom those highlights very nicely without the natural ND. Uh, it's just where I was finding it in many situations of how I light, I'm always lighting a couple stops hotter so I can use the neutral density. So when I come for the close up, I can, uh, eliminate uh, and, and keep the nose and the eye in focus. Now, here's a wonderful example of how the uh, digital diffusion works really nicely with these bloomed windows. Uh, it doesn't bloom them like it would with a black pro mist or a black satin or a Hollywood black magic. Uh, it, it just creams it out and you have the detail, but it's not... Uh, uh, it just puts this wonderful kind of gauze effect on it. Uh, but look at these beautiful skin tones that I'm getting uh, out of this actress um, in, in this thing. And here we are. Sorry, I'm having trouble hearing you. And Suri is just going off. Uh, and here we are with, again, the beautiful tonalities that is happening in his skin tone. Uh, in that environment. All right, so there you have it. I'm going to try and bring my camera back. 
Uh, and I know that uh, you were probably never saw my face. You just saw <laughs> the, uh, hopefully you saw the um, presentation, but uh, I'm just wondering if there were any questions and I want to thank you all uh, for, for listening and, uh, you know, hopping on with this, all these technical difficulties that we had. All right, Weldon, do we have any questions? None. <laughs> okay. Well, where are we, Weldon? Shane, how do you approach your white balance for each scene? Do you use a white card to balance, or are you just manually adjusting the Kelvin? Yeah, I manually adjust the Calvi, Calvin. So the question was, you know, how do you white balance? Do you use a white card? Uh, no, uh, those are the days of yore. Uh, w back when I was shooting Ikigamis, I, I haven't used a white card in my life since that. Uh, so I am literally um, going through and saying, if I want uh, my day exteriors to be a little colder, I'll go to 5,000 Kelvin or 5,200. Uh, that way the 5,600 daylight uh, that's there, it's going to be a slightly cooler tone. Uh, I never usually set the camera at 3,200. I'm more of a 3,700, 3,600 Calvin person uh, because what that does is it warms up the skin tone. So if I'm using tungsten light, uh, it makes it a little more red, yellow, golden. Um, and then if I want to do moonlight, uh, I like moonlight to be tungsten. Uh, I'm not a big fan of HMI Moonlight, so I will use my, um, you know, I will set my color temp to 2,900 Kelvin. Uh, then my t my Moonlight is 3,200 Kelvin, and it just makes it turn gray. It's absolutely beautiful. It gives us this slightly cool tinge, and then, uh, you know, with that. Because you're going 2900, you got to make sure that all your lights that you're playing, like say uh, lights and windows or whatever, all have half CTS on them because you're going to need to warm them up even more or put them on a dimmer to be able to dim them down so it has that nice warm tone that you would get from an air incandescent light because most incandescent lights trim out around 2700 Kelvin, uh, like a 100 watt. Uh, light bulb. So uh, I want to be able to make that warmer um, in that tonality. So you got to use, if you're using tungsten lights to bring up the ambience of windows and stuff for a night exterior looking into windows, uh, then I'm going to be using the ability of uh, that half CTS to slide the tungsten warmer. So I can use my moonlight as 3200 with 2900 on the Calvin of the camera to make that gray. All right, any other questions? Yeah, oh, we got a lot. Okay, so um, next one is about, uh, which, what does your strength combo look like between changing lenses and does, it, Matt, does that change based on the type of lenses you're using. So like if you're using digital diffusion, the strengths you use, and then if you're using cooks or using a set of light goes. Yeah, so that chart that, uh, so it was, you know, if you're using different lenses, do you use a different format of, um, you know, digital diffusion? Yes, uh, the softer the lens, then I'm going to be lowering those uh, values on the uh, digital diffusion. Uh, the sharper the lens, I'm going to be raising them. So the chart that I showed you was for Summicrons, which are a little softer than the Summiluxes. So based on that, a uh, 15 mil or a 16 mil Summilux, I might be using a seven. Uh, so, and depend, it's, again, you have to test this. You have to find your, what works for your, uh, project, for your feature, your commercial. But obviously, uh, this is kind of, you know, I'm sharing you, sharing with you. Let me bring that thing back up so I can just reference it once again, you know, and, and share the screen. Uh, you know, this diffusion chart, um, is something that is based on Leica Summicrons. And, uh, but yes, 
This is something that you want to test. Uh, I've kind of given you the roadmap of how it, it works. Um, but uh, it's, it's something very important that you test and make sure it's, it's exactly what you're hoping that your director is all on board for, as well as testing this with your colorist and, and making sure everything is coming out nicely with that. Okay. Next question is, um, you know, do you use MD filters to help you create contrast between the subject and the background? Now, I think the question is probably more towards lighting. However, I think you create contrast in a different way in that context. Yes. So creating contact, uh, contrast with neutral density would be more of a lighting thing. Uh, you can create somewhat uh, of, let's say, a three-dimensional image by using shallower depth of field. Um, and that is done by using a lot of neutral density. Uh, I like to be very intimate and feel like I'm immersed with my characters. So I'm not somebody that likes to lens from afar. I like to get in there, uh, especially with these 5K, 7K, 8K, LF, large format. I want to be in there, intimate, wide angle, pushed in close. And when you do that, you want that depth of field to really be extreme. And that's why engineering the 10 stops worth of neutral density on one filter, a 3.0 putting in there and not a 1.2, but literally a 3.0 to calculate 10 stops of neutral density is what's going to give you that three-dimensional and very cinematic quality. Uh, it's neutral density is so important in creating that neutral density. I mean, sorry, that shallower depth of field. Um, and then, you know, you can use lighting to then create that contrast and you can create color contrast that you saw a lot. Like, uh, I, I did a lot of color contrast, you know, specifically in, you know, um, you know, a Casa Tuta Bene. Look at the, the, the kind of slightly warmish tones on her skin with all the coolness in the background. And this was a time in the film where the wheels were coming off. Uh, they were sequestered because they came into this island on a ferry. A storm came in. They couldn't leave for three days. So they all had to live amongst themselves in this house and the skeletons came out of the closet. So when the first day that they were there, it was all bright and sunny and beautiful and open shade and, and there were hardly any shadows. And when the skeletons came out of the closet, it became a cavernous interior and I didn't light it as much and I let the shadows really fall off. So these were kind of the, the uh, mixes that I was doing, um, you know, and these different color contrasts as well as the lighting uh, to create that, uh, that unique feel. All right, what else we got, Weldon? Can you talk a little bit about this difference between like pearlescence, satins, and like HD digital diffusion, the effect more of the digital diffusion? Yeah, so much, uh, so using all different types of uh, filters. Um, you know, I have an amazing amount of filters in my library. I have black glimmer, I have glimmer glass, I have black satin, I have pearlescent, I have white pearlescent, black pearlescent, uh, black soft effects, just soft effects, white and black pro mist. All these are different brushes for your canvas. And... Um, but I have all, always been like, if I want to do a flashback, then I'll go uh, to Black Glimmer. Or I've actually used different OLPFs. Uh, Kipper Tie is a company that makes OLPFs that actually have uh, like stockings built into the OLPF. Or one they call Graphite uh, that uh, gives a, uh, you know, a filtration as well. So... With the red, you have all these uh, amazing things to bake into your RAW file. And that's why I love this camera so much because I can change so many things within it to be able to feel like it's more a photochemical experience. Uh, and that's where I'm coming from. I loved film. I loved everything that it gave me. I was very experimental in film. I mean, this is a person that... You know, when I shot Smashing Pumpkins, Cherub Rock, I shot my, 
you know, we shot the film uh, Super 8 at night, 50 ASA in a woods. And I took that film and I uh, used it uh, by developing it in my own bathtub. I turned my whole bathtub and, and uh, bathroom into a lab. And I would process the film. And I found that if I was at a, at a perfect, uh, you know, I would sing this song and it would give me the, the perfect developing speed. And then if I slowed it down, I would overexpose and it would blow out. And then I'd go faster and it would underexpose it. And these are the kind of things that I've always been into. Like Christ, I took 2378 that everyone said it was a magnetic stock, that it could not be exposed. There was no image to be had on this film that was the magnetic stripe for uh, putting fil uh, soundtrack to, uh, to the side of, of film. Um, and I found at ADASA 2378 was a beautiful black and white image that had so much silver in it that it was the genesis of what I did with Terminator Salvation. So all these, you know, looks came from photochemical and now I'm trying to use the red sensor to act much more in a photochemical way and that's why I've embraced that technology so much. Can you expand on that a little bit with the, like how the fact that you prefer to use red log film? Why do you like to use red log film over FP22? Well, so uh, people ask why I like red log film. Well, I've come off of that uh, because red has now developed the, IP, the IPP2 uh, workflow to take in legacy mode. So I'm able to use log 3G10 and red wide gamut in IPP2, but use the legacy in IPP2. And this is what I did on my last film uh, that I just shot with Netflix. And that was the secret sauce. Um, I was able to take all those settings that I loved within legacy and now use those in an IPP2 color space. And I started to see all the tonalities that I never would could see before. The subtle tonalities of that I started to see on the camera. And that really was starting to excite me. So now that Red has made the IPP2 play well in legacy mode and all those settings, I advise you to also do the same. But getting back to the black glimmer and all these other different types of diffusions, I see those as ways to do flashbacks, to um, like what I did in the ticket. Uh, I used Tiffin Black Glimmer Glass to create a dreamy effect where they went into this third dimension, almost an alter alternate reality. And so I used Heavy Glimmer Glass to bloom all the uh, lights down at the... Um, Santa Monica Pier, and we did it in a way that we use slow motion to also uh, show this process of this alternate re reality. Uh, and we used uh, a lot of camera sleight of hand uh, and color uh, where we started to see the, the vitality in the woman's skin up on the Ferris wheel start to dissolve away as you realize that this person has been dead the whole time that he's having a conversation with. So I tend to use these different uh, diffusion filters uh, depending on what the story kind of tells me. But what I have done as this is a combo platter that I'm using across uh, all of my projects, um, you know, that keeps this beautiful creamy skin tones, uh, you know, takes away blemishes and wrinkles very nicely and uh, enables the highlights to cream out uh, and create it so it meal feels much more like the Alexa in its roll off. Can you talk a little bit about um, like your approach to working with filters, like using NV outside, of, like capturing the, capturing the sun, whether it's daytime, sunset, sunrise? I've got someone asking, essentially they're budget strapped. They want to try to think of like, how, how can I shoot wide open at like a T2, but I can only run a few NDs. I think it's important to stress that like, 
in order to get out there, like how are you going to nail that having a wide variety of MDs is really important. Yeah, and having a wide variety of MDs are, are, is very important. And, you know, these variable NDs are not good to use because variable NDs are double polarizers. So you're twisting polarizers to get uh, that variable ND. And what it does is it takes all the sheen. Like as, as I rotate my face to the key light, uh, you, you saw it um, with in Resident Alien. Let's say, um, let me go to this image here. Let me share my screen. Um, so see how the, the skin has this beautiful sheen, uh, that is vitality, uh, where if you're using a variable ND, that forehead reflection is going to all, all of a sudden turn to powder. It's going to look like they have, uh, a lot of powder that's been applied to their face. So variable NDs are not a successful way to uh, be, you know, to save money. Uh, if I had to rent just three NDs, I would say I'd rent a nine, I'd rent a one five, and I'd rent a two one. Uh, because, you know, those are going to be giving you the ability to go at least seven stops worth of neutral density and, and keep that, uh, you know, shallower depth of field. But, you know, I would say, you know, renting is so much uh, cheaper than buying these filters. Uh, these filters are, are very expensive, uh, mainly because all the R&D that has to go into these things. Uh, if I just took a piece of glass and did what True ND did and just sprayed the, uh, the filter combo onto a piece of glass, that's a no-brainer. That's very easy to do. And that's why all the internal NDs, they just spray it directly onto a piece of glass. But when you're sandwiching that spray inside two pieces of glass, now you're dealing with all the different inconsistencies of what glass is, the different green levels that glass displays, and now that color science gets very, very dodgy. And it took us a long time to get those values to work out beautifully that way and be consistent across 10 stops worth of neutral density with no color shift. You talked a little bit about, I think this lends back to like the diffusion filters and stuff like that, is trying to create a photochemical film look in a digital world. Um, can you talk a little bit about your approach to that and how someone who's kind of starting out in a digital world would get there? Yeah, so, you know, starting out in a digital world and you're trying to get much more of a filmic look, there's, I say, three things that are going to do that very quickly. One is having a lookup table, a LUT, that basically takes the sensor's uh, color science and skews it more to film. So, you know, our digital sensors are there to give us what is in front of us. A blue is a blue, a red is a red, skin tone is skin tone. But with um, that's all great in the scientific world, but film never did that. If you look back to the history of Kodak film, what it was was why Kodak looked so much different than Fuji and absolutely different than Agfa uh, as film stock is because in the early days, everyone would be shooting photographs and they would constantly be sending the photographs back to Kodak and they would say, could you make it a little more red yellow? Could you make the skin tone a little warmer? Could you make it a little more red yellow and golden? So at, over the years, that's what Kodak came to be. Their skin tones had a more red yellow base than Agfa and Fuji. And that became something that was baked in. So, and when you do the red yellow shift on adding that to film, you get a blue in the sky that looks more cyan. And cyan is a much nicer tone than just blue sky. Uh, cyan has a little bit of green in it. Uh, I just love that tonality. So, with that, you get your first thing is finding a LUT that I've designed several that is based on 5298 Kodak film stock 
and it shifts the blues to cyan and shifts the skin tones to more of a red-yellow base. Okay, that's your first thing to a cinematic look. The second is using neutral density to create shallower depth of field. You should not be shooting over a four, ever. So I always keep in the beautiful range of shooting a two to a two eight. And then when I go into a hundred millimeter close up, I'll go to a four so I can keep the nose and the eyes in focus. Unless the character is going through something that you feel a shallower depth of field is going to work, then I'm going to rifle that thing down to a one four. So even the eye, if her head is slightly turned, one eye is in focus and the other eye is out and the nose is definitely out of focus, and the ears are out. So, you know, creating a shallower depth of field is your second uh, way to creating a cinematic look. And then the third is grain, or what I call gauze. So there's, uh, Da Vinci has a beautiful tool of uh, adding grain to your uh, digital image. So I'm doing that as well, but I like the grain added with this digital diffusion. So it, if you could say, am I using the digital diffusion to help the red sensor uh, seem more filmic? Absolutely. Uh, I'm taking the red sensors, um, let's say imperfections, and I'm perfecting them and I'm making them look more filmic by creaming out the highlights so they roll off much more in a filmic way, as well as adding grain within Da Vinci. Now, the Gemini has a very nice digital noise base, uh, and even at 1600 ISO, I love the digital noise. It looks very filmic, and the reason why it looks so filmic is that photo buckets are huge and they're lapping up that light so beautifully, uh, which um, gives that sensor a, a very unique feel. So those are the three things that I would say are your secret uh, kind of recipe for creating a filmic look. One, creating a LUT that swings the blues to a cyan and swings the skin tones to a little more red-yellow base. Number two is using neutral density be, to be able to create a shallower depth of field. And then three is going with some type of digital diffusion to kind of create that gauze effect along with grain to uh, give it that texture that we've all come to know and love. Are you ever worried about stacking filters like in the past we used to have ND filters that were made with diffusion filters? But is there a concern for you at any point of stacking multiple NDs with a diffusion filter? Is there a crazy problem? Oh, yeah. Stacking filters is a absolute disaster. Okay. And it takes a very, um, you know, seasoned cinematographer to really know uh, what you have to do to make these filter combos work. Uh, one of the first thing that's, that's like uh, every end, you know, um, camera AC that I work with is always puts the neutral density out front and then the diffusion filter on the inside. Well, with natural NDs, you cannot do that because natural NDs have a reflective tonality to them because they're reflecting the IR uh, back out from the sensor. So by putting the diffusion on the outside, you start to eliminate any double reflect reflection problems. Then you're going to also need an ARF, which is an anti-reflection tray. Now, Airy makes some, Panavision makes the best anti-reflection tray. I'm telling you, I'm going to be making one of those for my personal uh, kit. Because uh, now with uh, all these 3D printers, I'm going to start making my own ARF. Uh, you need an ARF that puts it at least at a 25 degree angle. Uh, and that is when you get into the tighter lenses. Because the tighter lenses is seeing less through the filter. So that's why I go down in diffusion. And you also have to angle the filter more because it's concentrating it in a smaller area of the piece of glass 
that you're photographing. So uh, I know like the 75 and the 100 are very problematic with the Summicrons and Summiluxes. So uh, the ARF automatically comes out. Um, I'm a big uh, Bright Tangerine Misfit uh, person. I love that map box because it has, uh, you sandwich the piece of glass there that you don't use trays. Because the minute you take the diffusion filter and the ND and bypack them with the ND first and the diffusion filter, when you have that air gap in between the two filters, that is when you're going to have double reflection problems. So with the Misfit Atom, it takes two pieces of glass and sandwiches them in to an ARF tray. It's very lightweight. I use the Ronin a lot. So this is a wonderful uh, matte box for all gimbals. It's incredibly lightweight. It has a beautiful eyebrow that you can extend off of it. And uh, an eyebrow is also a very important thing for you to have success with using any filtration. So if you're using any diffusion filtration whatsoever, you have to be flying an eyebrow. Because if you have a hot sky or a hot window or a hot light that's in the background, it is going to, uh, and if it's out of frame, it is going to cause a kind of a white gauze to your image. Uh, it's going to open up the shadows and create lower contrast. So my eyebrow is also always just flying out of the safe area of the image uh, and enable me to take all my, you know, beautiful soft sources or my batten lights that I use a lot. Uh, it keeps them out of the lens and enables the diffusion to work beautifully without uh, gauzing it out and, and making it uh, lower contrast. Okay, uh, a, couple, a few more. A um, couple questions of using some different filters to kind of increase the quality of inexpensive lenses, like, like a set of Dean primes. Like you've done a lot of tests with those and some people have asked about them. Uh, what kind of filters would you use in something like that to try to make them look a little more expensive, make them feel more like a, is it possible to make it feel more like a light or a Sumicron or something? Well, is it, basically the question is, is it, uh, is there a magic combo that you have to taking, you know, cheaper pieces of glass and making them look more cinematic? Uh, yes, of course, there's some things to make a lens feel more cinematic in the cheaper uh, end of the spectrum. But it's, um, but there's stuff that is, a cheaper lens is going to have a contrast fall off a lot more extreme than a $20,000 lens compared to a $2,000 piece of glass. And that's what you're paying for. You're paying for the gradation from highlights to shadows. That is literally the, the expense and how, that, how it falls off. When you're using a still lens, uh, you know, Photoshop and everything have so many tools to be able to get in there and that 32-bit color space and, and be able to dig all that stuff out, no problem. You don't have that in the video world. So uh, a, a, a cheaper piece of glass on a still camera you can uh, get in there and make it have that beautiful roll off a lot nicer than you would with a moving image. Uh, obviously, using you know digital diffusion is going to help make the lens look uh, more cinematic. Uh, like I said, using neutral density to be able to create that shallower depth of field, but there's really no magic combo that's going to give you uh, taking a uh, $2,000 or $3,000 piece of glass and making it look like a Summicron or a Summilux that's costing $30,000. That the, uh, the dichroic kind of, you know, halations and uh, weird where you get in the uh, finite detail and the hair and everything where you start to see that... Um, you know, red, the rainbow, I would say, uh, you see with cheaper a glass, that's just something that, you know, is there. And yes, you can use DaVinci to get rid of it. 
uh, and, and other different softwares, color grading softwares, but it is a challenge. So um, I always say that renting glass is how I roll out. Uh, I, I take each project as its own entity and the soul of the movie is what glass I choose. And there's sometimes where I'm going to be using Cooks compared to when I'm using Sumaluxes compared to when I'm using Anamorphics. Uh, so I really like to rent that glass. Uh, so it's it's the the soul of the film. Is there a last question? Okay. Is there any type of filtration that you used to use in film days that you're still using, and or you brought back that like as you use new technology and new lights, or maybe um, and then are you are 85 filters toast in a digital world? Do you use 85 at all? Okay. So the questions were like, uh, you know, were there any holdovers of filters that you've used in the past uh, on film that you're now currently using with uh, in the digital age? Uh, I would say, you know, 85s, you know, those are dead to us. Uh, obviously, we were using 85 filters when we were shooting with, you know, tungsten film stock. Uh, so that gave the, the, uh, daylight coming in that was going to be very blue and, and changing it to be, you know, balanced for that. So now that we have a color, you know, temperature wheel on all of our digital cameras, it's kind of eliminated the whole 85, uh, you know, filter, um, in diffusion filters, one thing that I used on film a lot was soft effects. I really loved how soft effects, uh, you know, reacted to, to skin tones, um, how it used kind of the same technology of digital diffusion being much more of, a, of an invisible uh, piece of diffusion, but it still would bloom highlights. So I kind of once, um, you know, the digital age really hit, uh, I was really seeking out a new filter that felt like the soft effects on film and that ended up being Tiffin's Digital Diffusion FX uh, that really addressed the blemishes and the wrinkles and giving me, me that creamy skin tone. And, you know, I do something that I feel, you know, I overexposed the digital negative, just like I overexposed film, almost a, a half to a full stop. I do the same thing on the digital negative. And I'm seeing... Uh, ways that specifically when I have other cinematographers shoot, uh, like on this, I had pickups on my latest movie with Netflix, Love Hard, and I had Mike Svitak come in and do uh, some uh, reshoots on it. He did some pickups that we had to do, some close-ups of phones. We, had, we wrote new scenes to kind of clarify the ending. Uh, and I could see how uh, Michael exposed the digital negative much differently than how I expose it. And that's mainly uh, with me being uh, overexposing it uh, a lot more. And it gives you a lot more range to work with where, you know, the stuff was falling apart a lot quicker with uh, the stuff that I use, was using with uh, that Mike Svitak showed. It's not that he did anything wrong. Uh, it's just the way you uh, expose your digital negative. I, I like it to be very thick, just like I liked my film thick. And you get that from overexposing. All right. Well, I think uh, there were a lot of great questions. And thank you so much for uh, submitting these. And, uh, and thank you so much, Tiffin, for presenting this wonderful platform for the Image Maker series. And Brian, I'm so sad that we weren't able to uh, shoot the, the shit per se uh, back and forth uh, with all this, but I really appreciate uh, everyone at Tiffin arranging this and thank you for the platform and uh, thank you for all your innovation uh, with me and with all the, the other filmmakers and director of photographies throughout the world. Uh, that's the one thing that I have to say, what I love about Tiffin is they listen to the filmmakers. They are there for the craft and they really get in there and help you uh, design, uh, you know, tools that make it better for you as artists. 
So thank you very much, Tiffin, and thank you all for being a part of this uh, presentation. Take care, everyone.